And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. He is one half of the double-headed monster that is Cobblepath Games, and currently creators of the upcoming um, personal horror RPG Locus, the one and only Jack Milton. How are you doing today, man? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good, thank you very much. Um, pleasure to be here. No, th thanks for <clears throat> thanks for coming on and braving the hell that is time zones in order to do so. <laughs> oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. Um, so it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings. So with, with that in mind, um, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what was it that made it um, stick for you? Interesting. Um, yeah, okay, so first real introduction to... Well, the first vague introduction to role play games was when I was really young. Sort of, uh, well, I say really young, not really young. When I was 12, maybe, I bought a starter set for D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. um, 3.5, I think, but it doesn't actually state it on the box that I still own. Um, and then I never found anyone to play it with at my school. So <laughs> I didn't play it, and I've still never played it. I've got the box, I've got all the stuff, but I've never played it. Um, and then when I was a little bit older, I was at college, which is high school for Americans, um, I started playing MMOs, and I started playing an MMO called Dofus, which is like really weird. It's a turn-based, tile-based strategy game, mm -hmm. MMO. Um, still going. Actually really recommend it, but um, don't play anymore, though. The, I met a load of people on there, as you do on MMOs. Um, and some of the people I met there, I sort of got in the habit of visiting them with my spare money and sort of traveling to the Netherlands and Finland primarily. And the first time I went to go and meet a couple of my friends that I'd made on that game, um, it was for their wedding. And at their wedding, or, or in the couple of days leading up to their wedding, when I went to meet them, um, they offered to run a tabletop game because I'd sort of said, I really want to get into tabletop. I've wanted to for years and I've never got a chance. Um, and what they did was they ran, they just basically let me come in and play as a random extra character in their current silly game they had on going, which was, um, it was a setting shift of uh, White Wolf's Aberrant system, mm -hmm. which is a, it's a superhero system uh, that it's really old. Um, and they shifted it to be sort of more of like a D and D esque setting. Um, and I spent a day sort of reading the book and made like messed up some character. And then we played a session and it was great. And I think the thing that really stuck with me from it actually more than anything, having very little idea of what tabletop role playing was like, other than the vague concept of what D D was like and having knowledge of like tabletop war games. Mm-hmm. The thing that stuck with me was in that entire session, I made one roll. And that wasn't because I wasn't doing anything. There was just only one point where the DM asked me to make a roll. Um, and it, it probably helps from the sort of like psychological point of view that that role was absolutely bonza. I got like 18 successes on 12 dice um, due to sort of like exploding dice, which mm -hmm. is just nuts. But like I think that sort of stuck with me, and that made quite an impression about what role playing around the table was. That's probably a bit different to a lot of people's beginnings, um, and honestly, it's quite different to the stuff I tend to play now. Like uh, I, I haven't had a, another session, I don't think, where I've only rolled once. Oh no, maybe I have because we've had sessions where we basically spend the entire time with the whole party just talking at each other, trying to figure out what we're doing next. Um, but it's not common and it's not the default, but I think that, that left an impression, I reckon. 
Now, yeah. With that, now with that in mind, um, now first, off, first off, how how did the how did the concept of something like Locus um, really really come to be? What was what was kind of the driving force of that? So, driving force of Locus was me and um, Steph, who's the other half of God Park Games. Um, we moved to Bristol with one of our other friends. Um, after uni, a couple like a year after we left uni, we moved. We all moved together to Bristol, and about I'm not sure how long it was. It might have been about a year in. We went to a um, went to a small sort of local game convention thing um, mm-hmm. for a lot of board games and tabletop stuff, and we were sort of having a look around and we're seeing quite a lot of really cool stuff, a lot of little indie games people are making. And we sort of, after looking around, we end up sort of early evening in the the bar of the hotel it's hosted at. Um, We're having a drink. We get to talking about the fact that we want to kind of make something and we should probably work together because the other housemate I've been who moved in with us, um, he and I had been working on stuff throughout uni and it never really worked, partly because I really wanted to make it finished and polished and really fully working as a potentially sellable product and that's not because i had ambitions of selling it and making loads of money as much as when i do creative stuff i tend to be of the mind that i will make it if i don't aim to make it like as good as it could be which can be manifested as you know commercially finished producty mm-hmm. not necessarily sellably viable but you know a finished complete thing that actually is well made i kind of approach things like that and he didn't he was just enjoying making it and he wanted to run it for himself and he had no interest in other people really playing it um and there's nothing wrong with his approach but the two sort of the two approaches were quite clashing and we never really managed to coalesce it into anything that properly worked so i mean steph sort of were talking and the idea was kind of like actually she was interested in producing stuff that would be finished even if we didn't ever sell it um and so was i and we thought we should work together on something what should we make and after some discussion we basically settled on the idea that we both really like horror we're both really interested in tabletop rpgs and the thing with tabletop rpgs is we had all the skills to make one um making a video game like i've taught video game design for several years and i know a lot about the theory of game design and i know a little bit about a lot of the processes but i don't have all of the skills to make a full video game i don't Mm -hmm. i'm not a 3d modeler i know the basics but i can't make 3d models i'm not an excellent pixel artist or a 2d animator um i do artwork but not to the level or with the enthusiasm that would be needed to make it. And I'm definitely not a coder. Um, but with a tabletop, you kind of need to have the game design knowledge, but which I've got, and you need writing skills, and you need to understand tabletop, which are things that we actually had. So you're like, we could, we could finish that. We could make that. Um, and we sort of set out to make a horror system because we felt that there wasn't, there wasn't a horror system that we wanted that we were aware of um and the main thing that we wanted from a horror system being big fans of horror films and horror games was we wanted it to actually be scary like genuinely scary Mm -hmm. and we kind of felt like the the ones that we were aware of which were kind of like world of darkness which is kind of like horror flavor but isn't really about horror um it just kind of uses a lot of the trappings of horror but not not real horror, not not like scary mm-hmm. horror, the kind of like the, the set dressing of horror to build a sort of more psychological, social kind of intense role play experience, which is all good and it achieves for the most part what it sets out to do, I think, but not what we were looking for. And then you've got Call of Cthulhu, which uh, I'm not found a D100 anyway, personally. I think it means that the whole game relies on the dice a bit too much um regardless of character a lot of the time and i think 
I think uh, I have heard far more anecdotes about Call of Cthulhu being funny than I have about it being scary. It's probably the simplest way to yeah. say. Um, um, when <laughs> when it comes when it comes to when it when it comes to a fair when it comes to a, a fair a fair amount of them. Um, Hor doing a horror game that's a that's genuinely scary um is definitely is definitely one that's rife with pitfalls um yeah definitely especially when you consider the mindset of people that are com that are coming to the uh, table and the fact that i'd say it's a lot i'd say it's a lot trickier to do scares in a group experience than it would be a um solo or even a duet yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah, and I think one thing to bear in mind, like with with tabletop design in particular as well, is as a designer, we own there is a level of control over the experience that we just plain don't have. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, a lot of I've I've had long conversations with a number of my friends about things I think aren't great about tabletop systems that we've played or tabletop systems that I've read or whatever. And a lot of the time people come back with the, well, a good DM will make it good. And I don't disagree with that because a good DM will make anything good. Um, I think the, the thing is, is that as a designer from, and as a, like when critiquing stuff, we can't really use that as a defense for stuff that does or doesn't work. And as a designer, from my point of view, when making stuff, it's very much falls into a category of a good DM will make any system good. A, a great DM will make anything really enjoyable to play. Uh, but a bad DM can make anything bad. Now, the thing is, is that you can't really account for genuinely terrible DMs in game design. But what you can account for is people who are inexperienced or not very confident or just not great. Like, on the sort of... I mean, we've got a five-year um, long Scion campaign in our, like, personal group. And the DM for that, I would describe as being supernaturally good at it. She's absolutely incredible as a DM. I am not that good as a DM and partly that's down to a lack of experience, but it's also just down to, I don't really have the presence at the table in the same way as she does. I don't have the level of control and understanding of a group of players that she does. And some of that's going to be built by experience definitely. But mm -hmm. the thing is, is I think that as a game designer, I've got to be designing for those people in the middle because a good system will make an inexperienced DM great. And any system is going to be good in the hands of a good person. But to, to sort of wind it back to the sort of point about horror being difficult, is that, yeah, absolutely, you've got to go into it with the mindset of it being horror. Uh, if you go into Locus with the mindset of it being a fun Saturday romp, it's probably not going to be that scary because with any horror genre, there is a level of buy-in you need from your audience. I also would probably say that if you're going to go into Locus with the expectation of it being a fun Saturday romp, you're pro probably just not going to have a good time because it's not built for that. Um, but I do, I do believe we've made design choices and we've made systems and we've, built what we've built locus around a bunch of methods and design sort of sets that will help it be scarier mm -hmm. and will help a what a, we call them directors in locus um will help a director build something that's a scary experience um because we've avoided a number of the main tropes and we've built some other stuff to kind of like set the tone in innately in the way the game works 
um, in a way that some others haven't. Um, I should probably caveat as well, by the way, that uh, there's a bunch of really awesome indie horror games out there. And when we decided that there wasn't anything on the market filling the niche that Locus fills, uh, we were not aware of any indie products. I'm still not actually aware of any indie products doing what Locus does, but just be aware I haven't read every TTRPG on the market. So there might be some, ab there's some absolutely awesome horror stuff out there already. Um, but I do think that we're doing some different stuff. It's mm -hmm. weirdly difficult to find horror set in modern day in TTRPGs. <laughs> I was kind of shocked at how few games I managed to find in that genre set. I'd, honest, I'd honestly pin that particular issue on the fact that so many, the fact that so many RPGs, so many, so many cases in when doing the contemporary horror, it's a case where the, um, where the, where the big, where the um, bigger entries end up having far, end up having far too much of an influence. Mm. Um, I.e., people yeah. people have the assumption that you have to do it in that particular uh, style. Yeah, Part, absolutely. And this is not a new phenomenon. Um, I remember read I remember reading an old review of um, Chill when um, Pace Setter was still around, mm. and it had referred to it as a horror game for the easily frightened, and was basically la and was basically lambasting it for not being as scary. Compared to um, ra compared to Ravenloft or um, World of Darkness, but especially Ravenloft, in this particular yeah. case, um, which is hilarious to me because Chill wasn't trying to go for um, gothic horror style style um, spooky. Um, mm -hmm. It was aiming more for um, the kind of horror that you'd see from original recipe universal oh right yeah and yeah it did it did lean into a, into a little bit of kitsch but so did the universal monsters so life imitating <laughs> art yeah um and I, yeah i think that there is you see it in all media as mm -hmm. well the, the big the big players influence everyone um and i think that there's a I am seeing it in the the sort of now that I'm joining the community because we've only really been part of the kind of online community of tabletop RPGs in the last like few months. Um, never really engaged with it outside of the groups I was in in person before um, we sort of started gearing up for Kickstarter proper. Um, and I'm glad we did because it's great. There's a really good community online. Uh, but I'm seeing a lot of sort of a lot more of an understanding now than I'd ever really encountered before of the idea of different games for different experiences. Mm -hmm. But I think there's still that very much that culture of people don't appreciate the idea that different games can be built to facilitate different experiences more effectively. So they look at something like horror and they assume it works exactly the same as another horror game they've made. And it's always a kind of like one-to-one -one comparison of, is this better than the one I've already played rather than how is this different? What's, what's it trying to achieve that's different um and, and it's tricky um mm -hmm. cuz how do you control a, an audience's pre-perceptions or something well, the answer is you can't really but um <laughs> especially when you have no idea what those pre-perceptions are unt yeah um ahead of time mm. And I think so, sometimes the best you can do is just to basically outright wear it on your sleeve. We are not this thing, mm -hmm. which we've we've kind of done with Locus. We've kind of just gone, look, we're not Call of Cthulhu. Yeah, We're not saying Call of Cthulhu is bad, but we haven't made Call of Cthulhu. It's very different. Like the genre of horror that we're going for is incredibly different. Um, and we initially didn't say that, actually. Um, but we were convinced that we should put that into the campaign um, to sort of make that distinction. And ad admittedly, um, for whatever reason, um, that part that particular style has al almost a 
almost a chokehold on the on the on the notion of doing um, psychological horror. Um, and this is this is not me. Um, this is not me jumping jumping on the slam bandwagon when it come when it comes to Lovecraft's work or anything. It's like that. It's just a case of that is just one angle, and. Honestly, calling calling Lovecraft's work horror is um, debatable, but yeah, I think um, I think it, it. I would class it as horror, but I mm. wouldn't class it as psychological horror. Um, but that might just be because my perceptions of the genre of psychological horror are relatively specific. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's weird that it's got such a chokehold because Lovecraft's stuff is so specific. within the genre of horror it's really quite a very specific thing mm -hmm. and um, it could it could be argued that he that his work leans more into weird fiction rather than um, horror especially especially given the pulp times that he was writing in yeah i think like some of his stories are distinctly just sci-fi or sci-fantasy mm-hmm um, some of them are distinctly quite kind of like scary, horrory stories, but they all lean into there's a very strong theming in pretty much everything he's written, which is to to draw back from the specific trappings that he tends to use is all about a fear of like a fear of outsiders slash a fear of being an outsider. Is, is really prominent and I mean the the punchline of a huge amount of his stories is essentially wait the white man isn't top of the pile no <laughs> which is yeah not great but but the core of the, like the core fear that he's dealing with in a lot of the sort of horror stories is about the idea that we don't know stuff and the world that we think we're in isn't the world that it is. And we aren't as, we don't have the control over our lives that we think we do and things like that, which is, there is something there that people find evocative mm -hmm. and find affecting, um, but it's really specific, Yeah, which makes it very strange that he's so um prevalent like the the works of lovecraft or or just in general cosmic or eldritch horror are so prevalent in the ttrpg space but i think part of it is because a lot of the i think the i think for i think it's a case of that was a lot of people's first yeah i thought but i think it's also that there's a lot of the trappings and the set dressing and the the sort of the the imagery from Lovecraft's work in in particular D and D, but in a lot of big tabletop games as well, like they he, the the imagery from what he used is used a lot in some of the other games, which I think probably reinforces that that aesthetic of his being a major part of the TTRPG landscape to mm -hmm. some extent um in the same way that the fact that like it's used a lot in say doom probably means it's probably one of the reasons why lovecraftian i like visuals are used quite a lot in video games in general and nerd culture in general actually i think yeah but yeah locus the when i when i um when i was looking at it um the vibe that I ended up getting, as far as the style of horror that it that it's doing, was, um, was um, and I and this might sound, this might sound a bit odd, but almost almost um akin to a dark fairy tale, um. When it comes when it comes to the, when it comes to the whole concept of the monster in the closet or or the like, just taken to a much further extreme. Yeah, like I think it's got very similar roots. Um, there's a, it's it's. You could absolutely like. I mean, you could run that in it. To be fair, um, mm -hmm. 
it's it's got that sort of very heavy narrative backdrop to the way like narrative theory backdrop to the way it's been made um which is partly because i i didn't formally study narrative theory but i studied narrative theory in my own time and i taught it for a while um so there's a lot of kind of like how do these how do you build themes in story how do you make character arcs work how do you deal with sort of like the tropes of horror and stuff is all there's a lot of that baked in which i think probably leads to that almost fairy like dark fairy tale kind of stuff and and i mean it's there's not a massive barrier between that and a lot of horror films as well like some of the major influences like pan's labyrinth for example mm -hmm. Pan's Labyrinth is basically just a really dark fairy tale. It's not a traditional horror in the vein of stuff like some of our more kind of overt influences, like, say, um, There Goes My Mind Blank on literally every horror film I've ever watched. So. <laughs> <laughs> like, things like The Grudge mm -hmm. is an overt horror, or, um, or like Triangle or Event Horizon. Um, yeah. Those are some major influences from films on thing, and Pan's Labyrinth isn't a horror in the same vein. But it's very much a dark fairy tale that does have the same kind of ideas here. And I think is it Insidious? I think it's Insidious is the one that I I define as a dark fairy tale rather than a horror film from that studio. Because they, they made Sinister and they made Insin Insidious, didn't they? Um, I don't know if you've seen either of those films. Um, I've seen Insidious. It um, definitely showed that the, that the Saw guys aren't one-trick ponies. Yes. Um, it's, the, it's the one with the red demon in it. Yeah. Yeah, but the one with the red demon in it, I would define as less of a horror film and more like a dark fantasy. My personally, um, because it, it felt very um late 80s, like obviously it was a bit more sort of like aimed at a much older audience than stuff like uh Dark Crystal or um Never Ending Story and stuff, but it actually felt fairly similar to me to those kinds of stories. I'm sort of like late 80s, sort of nasty fantasy. Yeah, where it's it's more it's um not it's I remember a friend of mine calling it funhouse horror, which is not too far off. Like the kind mm. of horror you the kind of horror that I would see at um at at some at some sort of um Halloween at the fairground kind kind of thing in um my neck of the woods. Yeah. Yeah, I get what you mean. Um, yeah, yeah, I think... Not to yeah, sound too American with like, that. <laughs> no, we have... We do have carnivals. They're not mm -hmm. as... They're, they're usually just nicked from you guys, I think. Like, um, <laughs> in terms of, like, concept. Um, but yeah, I know what you mean. Um, I, I'm familiar. And I think, yeah, the... Insidious, to me, was a lot more dark fantasy, fun housey horror, but Sinister's actually a bit closer to actual real horror mm -hmm. um well i say real horror that's really limiting um something that's a bit more specifically horror that's a better phrase um yeah i think locus is it has that sort of thing it's it's very built around the idea that you need to sort of like connect with your character, but your character is the the sort of the auger for the horror rather than the horror being a thing that's just happening to them. Yeah. Um, in that regard, I do have to ask when, when, de when, um, when you were, de when you were developing this, um, did anyone make any comparisons to silent Hill? Oh, Silent Hill is a major influence. Um, and yes, people have made um, comparisons to it, to Silent Hill. Um, mm -hmm. 
Silent Hill's one of it's actually not one of my favorite horror games, but it's definitely one of Steph's favorite horror games. And I do think I do like the series and I like what it's doing. And um, we didn't set out to make Silent Hill the tabletop. Straight up, that was never one of our goals. Mm -hmm. But we did end up arriving at a lot of the same like trappings and details and like sort of not necessarily themes because the themes in um locus are quite open but a lot of the same kind of like methods and sort of details and specifics that silent hill also arrived at um we didn't get a lot of them from silent hill specifically i think we just ended up in the same place mm -hmm. in a lot of parts because we went through the same kind of like inspiration ringer essentially um but there is there is a not insignificant amount of silent hill in locus absolutely and um i think if you wanted to run a silent hill game you'd be hard pressed to find something that does it better than locus does and I say that with an understanding that if uh, Konami ever released a tabletop version of Silent Hill, I wouldn't expect it to be any good. <laughs> well, I would. Well, if Con well, this, given the state of Konami, if they release, if they released, and if they released anything, I don't expect it to be very good unless it's something that's just a rejig of when they were at when they actually knew how to do things and didn't and weren't firing yeah. all their people who are competent. Um, uh, I completely agreed. Although they did manage to actually mess up the re-release of Silent Hill two and three, didn't they? Somehow. Well, <laughs> um, the um, but uh, that a that yeah, HD think, collection. Yeah, like um, I wouldn't expect them to make something good. I I I think some if someone set out specifically to make a Silent Hill tabletop, and that was their goal, and they were someone who knew what they were doing with tabletop, and they were serious about making it good, they'd probably make something that fit better than Locust does. My, gu until my guess is... that specifically, mm -hmm. um, I think Locust would be a good bet for running a Silent Hill game. Yeah, um, It's not what it's for, it's not what we made it for, but yeah, there are definitely parallels there. Um, I'm not going to deny those. Yeah. <laughs> um, when it comes to... Now, first off, the uh, part of the reason that the Silent Hill HD collection ended up sucking so hard, um, Konami <laughs> lost the source code. Yeah, I know. I know. I know the story. Um, oh. oh, boy. They just don't know what they're doing, do they? I keep, I keep, I always try and keep those stories, those stories around, um, as a, at, at, one, as a reminder that even when I fuck up, I don't fuck up that bad. Um, <laughs> And to and to to give to um give myself some perspective when it when it com when it comes to what not to do, um yeah. <laughs> and the I'd imagine I'd imagine personally that if somebody if somebody was commissioned to do a Silent Hill RPG, they'd probably do it for a bit and then run into a brick wall because of how um, personalized Silent Hill type stories are, mm. and then just say screw it and, and end up doing their own thing. Possibly, I don't know. I think, I think there's there's ways you can do it. Um, I mean, honestly, we kind of ended up doing it with like us mm -hmm. um, a, a big core sort of concept of the game is building that kind of personal level to the characters and to their experience in the game mm -hmm. and with the horror and making it all linked together with their sort of personal themes and background and stuff. Um, yeah. So I, I don't think it's an insurmountable obstacle. Um, it's whether people would do that. Um, I think that there's enough really creative, really talented TTRPG designers out there that there would be people who could do it and would be able to make something that fits Silent Hill better than Locust does that we've done. Um, um, whether they'd be the ones doing it, though, that's a whole other question. Yeah, and of, 
Of course, there's there's the problem that um, Konami only cares about only cares about mobile games for like a few months before they decide to kill it off because yeah, for some well, in the case of that Castlevania mobile game, despite the fact that nobody asked for that, for some <laughs> asinine reason, they decided to have the most of the uh, beta testing for that localized to Canada. That's a very strange decision. That's exactly the kind of very strange decision I kind of expect Konami to make these days, sadly, yeah. but that's a very strange decision. The question why you wouldn't want to try and go for the biggest sample size you could is one of those questions that's left to the great minds of gaming because clearly I'm not smart enough to figure to figure out the galaxy <laughs> the galaxy brains over at Konami. Um, no, yeah. I think I, I wouldn't trust Konami to commission a good tabletop RPG. I, I just wouldn't. I wouldn't trust them to commission it. Well, I wouldn't trust I'd, them. To I would trust. I would trust them as far. I would trust them as far enough that I that I'd expect them to do the Roman handshake. <laughs> yes. You know, shake. You know, shake with the right hand, stab with the left. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. yeah I I fully expect that as well. But I think. I, I mean, aside from the fact that let's be honest, Konami's never going to bother. Mm -hmm. um, they're never going to try and make that. Um, but, you know, some enterprising young or or not, you know, some enterprising indie game dev might decide to make a Silent Hill game for free, yeah. um, like I'm doing with the Zelda system on the side. Um, can't sell it for money, but the, somebody might decide to make that game. And I think if somebody went hard at it, they'd make something that fits Silent Hill better than Locust does, because Locust isn't built to be Silent Hill the game specifically. But I do think that until somebody actually does that, Locus is probably the best you're going to get for running a Silent Hill game because they they run parallel to one another quite a lot in a lot of places. Um, and there's a lot of uh, similar conclusions and similar sort of design concepts and aesthetic concepts that the two have linked up together with and arrived at the same way. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Now, one thing, one thing that I, one thing that I do want to highlight when it comes to the system that Locus uses, mm -hmm. is the concept of the place being the antagonist, which is definitely interesting when I compare that to other horror games, in the sense that when you think about what makes a horror, what makes a um horror game or when it comes to video game sense or what makes a um a horror film scary it's being in a place that you otherwise shouldn't be in mm -hmm. um in the like when you're sit when you're yelling at the screen during a film don't go don't go in there you're going to get you're going to get yourself skewered that's a horror movie <laughs> um doing what it's supposed to um mm -hmm. and when it comes to games it's putting the player in those um sort of sort of situations but a lot of times that particular environment, at least when it comes to tabletop, isn't really emphasized. Um, yeah. Like... Sorry, Karen. <laughs> and some of it I can understand why, because it's because again, it's really hard to do atmosphere when you've got multiple people at at the table. Mm. Um, but I don't. But I don't think that's it. That's that's any reason to not try. And it looks like with this, you are trying because. It isn't a case of the monster of the week with this. The area itself is the is your enemy. Yeah. Um, so first up, like I'm really surprised it's not more common as well, because <laughs> um, it's a really common horror trope. Like tons of stuff does it. Um, most of our, I mean, mo most of our major influences that we listed on the. Um, on the, the Kickstarter page, do just that. Mm -hmm. um, the Silent Hill Event Horizon, Triangle, and um, Triangle, yeah. Um, Pan's Labyrinth has elements of it. Um, things like The Grudge, where, yeah, technically the, the terror comes from the ghost, but they're very specifically linked to a location. Um, and you've also, you know, Amityville Horror, which is one of the most famous horror stories out there, is all about the house being evil. It's it's not a 
it's not a trope that's in everything, but it is a trope that's common enough that we were kind of surprised that we haven't seen more of it. Um, I think part of it is that you run the risk if you make the place the monster. You run the risk of running into the issue where the characters can't realistically win, which is a bugbear of mine in a lot of horror, actually, where the antagonist you're against is so powerful that it makes no sense that the characters would make it out. Mm -hmm. Um, We have reasons why that's not the case in Locus. Um, There's a whole bunch of sort of like internal logic about how the places work. Um, That's all pretty much all in the director's guide rather than the player's guide um, for obvious reasons. But that was something we had to kind of work out and build up as well. Um, But the... I think think the, the thing with the atmosphere note though about it's difficult to get atmosphere while at a table of people i completely agree it's difficult but i do think it's also pretty much necessary for any type of horror um rather than it's not an exclusive issue to locationally based horror um but yeah so there's I'm not entirely certain why it's been so rare, but I do think a bunch of it is because it's it's difficult to do mechanically without making the place either completely impotent or absolutely ridiculously crazy deadly to the point at which it doesn't like there's no reason why a character would ever make it out. Um, but I mean, we, we've we've got around that in a number of ways, um, but it was something that we did have to work around quite actively when we, when making Locus. Mm-hmm. Now, you're using a now you're using a um, 3D6 system. Um, mm-hmm. Was that the die system that you had that you had intended from the start, or were there other ones that um, got weeded out? Um. So actually, yeah, the, the 3D6 system was one that we actually made really early on, and then it just kind of worked, so we never got rid of it. <laughs> well, it's a good bell curve. Yeah, like, and it, it fit with the... So one of the... So when we first started, we set out some sort of, like, rules for the system of, like, what we were trying to achieve, um, which is something that I absolutely recommend any designer does. Um, even if it's, like, only one or two, because ours were, like, two. It was the place is the bad guy or the antagonist antagonist at least the mm-hmm. place is the antagonist and we want it to be scary those were our two initial goals and we very quickly added another one that was to do with the dice system and the a- attributes more specifically which was the negative attributes um because we noticed that in horror films and horror stories characters don't succeed because of what they're good at they fail because of what they're bad at so we we built the system so that you don't spec your char- what your characters are good at. You spec what they're bad at. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, as a sort of five-point system, which we just kind of cobbled up, and then built the dice roll system around it. Um, it just kind of worked really well. It's a nice bell curve, and it, it's... The, the key things that we really wanted it to do were we wanted it to feel... We wanted failure to always be, or, or at least role failure, to always be a possibility, regardless of how good you were at something, because it's a horror game. Um, in a lot of games, I don't actually like that. I, I In most tabletop games, if my characters are really good at something, I don't want them to always be able to fail at that thing, if it's a fairly simple thing. Um, but in a horror system, that feels appropriate to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but we also wanted it to be that character's attribute layout made a difference and felt like it made a difference rather than just kind of being a thing that you did but then the dice roll kind of is what decides it anyway and so the the way the dice work in locus is you roll 3d6 
and then you take either the lowest, the middle, or the highest, depending on whether it's a hard, medium, or easy roll, respectively. Um, and you're looking to beat your stat. So you want to get higher than what you've got. So mm -hmm. a six is always a success, but a one is always a failure. No, sorry, a six is not always a success. Or is it? Yeah, six is always a success, one is always a failure. So this is me having mired myself in plugging the system for so long and building a Kickstarter campaign that I've forgotten how it works <laughs> in some regards. Um, but so success and failure are always a possibility. But if you're doing a hard roll on something where you need, where you've got a five in your stat, for example, that means you need to roll three sixes on 3d6 mm -hmm. to succeed, which is really not very likely. Um, and it, it means that characters... The, the the setup that you the stats that you give your character feel like they actually matter that character feels like they have a mechanical identity which we wanted to have um for a number of reasons one is because we personally really like that um but two is also because a big part of horror for us is the fear of making mistakes and the fear that you have made mistakes which is one of the easiest fears to play with mechanically. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we also got resource management, mm -hmm. like thematics in there as well, and um, mechanics, is we want people to feel like if they get into a situation where they're asked to roll frailty and their frailty is really high, we want them to be second-guessing whether this was the right thing to do. And it's a little bit meta because obviously you've built a character and you've built character stats in a way. But those little niggles in the brain, those little sort of like, oh God, I wish I hadn't have statted them like this. It helps build the tone and the atmosphere in a sort of subtle way. Um, but yeah, the, the I have made games where I've changed the dice roll significantly over time, but mm -hmm. Locus was one where we kind of settled on it pretty early. Yeah. It didn't really go through the dice roll itself. Didn't go through any revisions. Other parts of the system absolutely did. Yeah. Now, um, putting aside the fact that I do, I do get a chuckle at uh, the fact that the um, character sheet is the size of a playing card. Um, one thing, one thing that I did, one thing that I did want to ask specifically within it is. <laughs> Is the no, is the notion of haunt and and virtue and um. Why why go why go with the uh, playing card motif with that? Are is there are there going to be some elements where playing cards are a thing? Yes. So um, you use a deck of playing cards in the game. Mm -hmm. Um, it is a primarily narrative mechanic. Um, so the way it works is essentially every player has a hand of cards. Um, if you draw something that's the same as your virtue card, you immediately get rid of it and get some willpower. Or oh, the same suit as your virtue, sorry. Um, if you draw something that's the same virtue as your as the same suit as your haunt, it's more difficult to get away to throw away. You have to do more significant actions to throw them away. Um, the players have a hand of cards, and the director uses the amount of cards in each player's hands and as a sort of like average across the group to help them make narrative decisions about how the world is reacting to them and how things are going. And the players use them as an indication of how prevalent in their mind their character's haunt is. So the haunt is essentially something that they have an, an event or an action in their past that weighs on them. And it can be stuff that's not necessarily morally black. It can be stuff that's arguably morally white. But if they feel bad about it or it's something that they second guess a lot, it can count as a haunt. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the haunt does a lot of different things in the system. Um, but one of the things is that it's the, it's the main thematic through line that the characters have to the horror that's going on. And the cards are kind of indicative of how much that's present for them at any given moment uh, and the director uses it. It, it the card system was something we decided we wanted in really early 
and it went through about three or four major reworks. Um, there were some points where cards were used to augment roll results, so you could spend them from your hand to get really good rolls. And that ended up being just really power gamey, which is obviously really not what we want for a horror. No, game. that's the that's the complete op. I don't. Yeah. I I have yet to I have yet to find a game where you can where you can do outright horror while being a full on munchkin. <laughs> yeah, no, you can't. It's it's not. It's just not conducive to the. I th I think you could do like a a single horror session that's built around the fact that the fact that you're a munchkin isn't good enough. But you can't run a campaign like that because no. because you need to establish the fact that you're a munchkin before that's effective. Um, so you need a campaign's worth of being a munchkin. Um, but yeah, like uh, it went through a number of different things, and the, the version we settled on is very much a kind of a, a a system of narrative indication for both the players and the directors. Um, but it's also the the card motif, obviously, which is run through with the player cards being cards and item cards being cards. And the monsters having a card as well um, is also used to split things. So haunts are split into four different types. Um, I should, shouldn't say types; they're they're more like the the driving forces behind what happened, um, which are each aligned to a suit. So you've got hearts, which is malice; um, spades, which is apathy; clubs, which is uh, discord, which is about mm -hmm. sort of like lack of community um and then you've got diamonds which is temptation and then you've got virtues of the opposite sides of those um so it, it sort of allowed us to kind of thematically split stuff like that as well and which works quite nicely and it the ma a major thing that the haunts and the suits are doing is you make monsters based on the haunts of the characters and we've got a guide in the director's guide of the kind of imagery that can generally be associated with that kind of haunt. Um, with things like colours and textures mm -hmm. and symbolism thrown in so that you can kind of help people build the monsters around what the characters have built their haunt around. In that in that regard, would it be would it be um would it be fair to say that the that the um I don't know how to put this that within the within the book even even with the haunts that are cre that are created there isn't a full on traditional bestiary but more of general ideas about about potential um encounters and cr and creatures to try and survive I think you cut out there or I cut out I didn't hear any of that um what I was what I was asking is, do you think do you think it would it be fair of me to say that the idea of a of a standard bestiary when it comes to things like haunts is de-emphasized? Yes. Um, yeah, we don't have one. Um, there is no bestiary. There is a system for making monsters. Um, we're playing with how to do pre writs as well. Um, we've got one in the book that we're actually currently rewriting because we weren't happy with the version in the original version. Um, and I'm writing one at the moment that's like a quick start guide. So those have pre-made monsters in them with pre-made visuals. But the actual core system itself is built around the idea that you make the monsters yourself. Um, mm -hmm. And mechanically, they're very easy to make. Um, mechanically, they only have four stats an optional ability, oh, sorry, five stats, an optional ability, and each stat has a descriptor. And that's all they are. Um, so mechanically, they're very, very easy to make. But it's the, it's the thematics of the monster that are the reason why just giving people monsters kind of doesn't really work in Locus. Um, but we have tried to give people the tools to make effective 
symbolic monsters for each character. And within that, within that, um, so I, I'm guessing it'd be a case where the, where um, in, instead it's more it's more based on cues than anything else. Or yes, yeah, so... I suppose a better term would be bullet points. Yeah, kind of. So, um, essentially, without parting the veil too much, just mm -hmm. in case people want to be players, but it's it's not the biggest deal. Um, monsters have stats that are um, attack, chase, search, resistance, and then they have a weakness. Mm -hmm. um, the first four are numbered like a character stat is. And they're essentially how good the monster is at those things. Monsters don't do anything but those things. They only attack people or search for them or chase them if they're running um, or resist being attacked when they're attacked. Um, and then we've got for each of the haunt types. So, for example, Malice, um, we've got a bunch of sort of symbols and ideas of what a Malice monster might typically look like. Um, so I think Malice was uh, testing my memory of my own book. Um, Malice is sort of like red to yellows mm -hmm. is the typical color palette. And um, there's a lot of sort of like violent, um, like blood is a really common thing with Malice monsters, as are like knives and blades. Um, so we've got like a, a guide of the kind of things that tend to be there. But ultimately, it's about looking at what your characters what your player characters are have as their haunts and building something around that so for example if somebody's horn involves say a car crash whether it happened to them or they were involved or um, they crashed their car into something or whatever and whatever the outcome of that was and the reasons that they have it as a horn you can use imagery from cars in the monster so the monster might have sort of like headlights uh, or eyes that look, uh, reminiscent of headlights or give lights off. It might it might make the noise like tires screeching when it opens its mouth. Um, and the idea is to kind of make the monsters evocative of that thing that weighs on the characters. Um, because that's how you drive home that the characters' failings and their past are what is impacting them now. Mm-hmm which is, you know, that's much scarier than just a dude is out to get you. Or at least we think so. Um, and it's obviously a major theme in psychological horror in general. It's about the psychology. It's about people's own perceptions of things and an awareness of their own character and how that impacts the world around them and stuff, which is kind of what the genre is about. Um. Now with that now with that in mind would when I look at the sheet I'm guessing that the that um willpower would would that be akin to an extra effort um sort of setup um yeah kind of it's it's a reroll mechanic so yeah. uh, extra efforts more it's got a load of stuff hasn't it extra effort in M&M &M. um but yeah it's it's the reroll mechanic so mm -hmm. um the way willpower works is you spend willpower and depending on how in, on your stress level which is above it on the character card um depends on how many dice you can re-roll for the spend of a willpower um, but you can spend as much willpower as you want on a roll and you can just keep re-rolling dice if you've got the willpower to spend but it gets really expensive especially if you're mm -hmm. stressed um now with that with that in mind with that in mind um when it when it came to now you've had a couple of stretch goals the, about um alternate settings with some with some um with some guest artists when it when it whose whose idea what whose was it your was it your idea to put in the potential for alternative settings instead of just contemporary or was that something that you had always considered as a possibility? It's something we always considered. The 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 default setting is technically 
contemporary horror, but really Locus is setting agnostic. Um, it doesn't have a set setting. Mm -hmm. um, it has a very specific game setup. The, the location is the bad guy. Characters all have something that's weighing on them from their past. Monsters will manifest based on that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as far as the setting goes, it's always been really open. In fact, the first full play test we did was set on a spaceship and was a sci-fi one. Um, so, like originally, technically, though not really, the system was a sci-fi horror system because it was the first full session we ever ran was in sci-fi setting. Um, but we sort of the 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 quote unquote default is contemporary but the ability to run it in any other setting has always been a factor a factor of the system um which was less because it was a design goal per se like it wasn't something we ever mandated had to be the case and more just because we never felt the need to tie it down to anything so it just kind of worked um and because of the way things like items work in Locus, the the sort of technology level that you're dealing with in the game doesn't actually impact the mechanics of how the game works at all, which is quite nice. It's not like how if you were to try and put a gun into D&D, for example, it would fundamentally change certain aspects. Like you'd have to make a new type of item for how a gun would work in D&D, and it would ultimately potentially change some of the sort of like balance of how that's going to work and things in locus if you put a laser gun in it's no different it doesn't change anything in the way the system mechanically works i can i can definitely uh, i can definitely see that um now when it comes now first off the what are you shooting for as far as page size with the with the completed book? Um, so it's two books um, split into a player guide and director's guide, mm -hmm. um, which is mostly just because there's a ton of stuff in the director's guide that we want to make it very clear players ideally shouldn't read. Um, it's not quite paranoia where you can still play it and enjoy it if you know the stuff behind the veil but it's slightly better if you don't um we think so we, we wanted to split the books um the player's guide is approximately 60 pages and the director's guide is approximately 150 um we're kind of hope we we're actually after doing some research during the kickstarter and such we're thinking that they're probably going to be larger than that because those are the the version zero that those estimates are based on mm -hmm. um is not very spaciously laid out um it's it's very compact layout wise there's a lot of information on every page mm -hmm. um we could probably with a layout um effect add at least 50 percent to each of those very comfortably um we're probably not going to because more pages equals more printing costs and we've costed the printing up based on those estimates but they're probably going to be a little bit more than that i think uh, a little bit more than 150 and a little bit more than 60 for the player's guide um partly because there's some additional information going in that wasn't in the version zeros and also because we've got professional graphic artists now doing the layout for it. And I think he's going to be a little bit more uh, conservative with how much he puts on the pages than I was when I did it. <laughs> um, which will be good because it will make it much easier to read, I think. Um, with, the, with that kind of thing in mind, so... Now, first off, congrats on managing to smash through the initial goal, because if I'm reading this right, you were initially asking for 6,000 pounds and you're at 9.2 thousand. Yep, that's uh, correct. Uh, so, thank you. So, this has got 12 days to go, and <laughs> what I'm and what I'm what I particularly am, cur am curious about is um. 
after it after it's after it's all said and done and after the um extra paperwork that comes with a concluded Kickstarter. Um, what are you shooting for as far as a release date? Um, are you aiming for sometime in December or are you aiming for sometime um, earlier? Um, so we're aiming for January for digital release, mm -hmm. um, which is mostly just to give us enough time to do it, but it's also because um, January 1st is when our exclusivity deal with drive through ends. So on January, we can release it on more than just drive through, which we want to do. Um, and the physical books were initially um, pegged for April next year. But since we're not looking at, since it's incredibly unlikely that we're going to get to the um, £21,000 to have a second book printed, a third book printed, I should say, for the settings. Um, we're probably looking at it being earlier than that now. Um, I don't really want to speculate as to when, though, because I don't want to <laughs> set it up. But it, uh, I would, would they should be out before April next year. We're hoping significantly before April next year for the physical books to be delivered to people. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, the digital is aimed for January release, hopefully really early January, because um, we've got a month worth of editing. Uh, so, so we're we're not going to be able to send the any of the documents off until um, end of September because Kickstarter takes a while to send through the money after your campaign finishes. Mm -hmm. And we, the first thing we're doing is we're going to send the books to the editor, who's given us a month turnaround, um, and then once it's edited, it will then go to both the sensitivity reader and the graphic artist separately um and the graphic artist given us about a month turnaround as well which means that theoretically we could be looking at december release and we might release it in december um there's a good chance we might be giving it to the backers in december but i'm not going to hold myself to that and we will say january uh which is what we've said on the campaign at the moment yeah. January for digital releases and um, April for physical. Well, not, nothing like nothing like the winter to keep <clears throat> everybody ho everybody hobbled to everybody hobbled together around a table. Yeah. Well, oh, one thing that I should actually add in terms of release dates, though, um, the quick start guide that we're releasing, um, which is actually part of we've we've done it as part of the folklore jam mm -hmm. on itch.io. Um, and that's something I've personally done on the side rather than cobble path specifically is done, but, um, that's going to be out hopefully next week. Um, but we'll also be bundled in as a free addition to all backers that they'll get pretty much immediately as soon as the campaign ends, or at least as soon as we get the, the money and the confirmation and that two week period ends, um, it'll be a pretty much immediate, um, free edition, which is a, it's a quick start one shot that we've written. Um, um, so you can hopefully start playing the game pretty quickly. Just make sure to knock on wood. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Good shout. Okay. <laughs> um, as, at the moment, we've got two, one tiny section and a couple of details to figure out. An edit read through, read through, and then I've got to draw a load of it. Um, I've got to draw, draw a few more images, and we've got to put them in. But it's mostly done. Mm -hmm. um, so well, i'll be i'll be definitely looking forward to that um with that said i do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to the uh, show and anytime you oh, I, I want to thank you for having me on the show <laughs> <laughs> and of course any, anytime you see fit to um to return to return the door is always open as i often thank say you. around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged <laughs> awesome thank you very much my pleasure yeah. and of course a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness and there'll <laughs> be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet but until then on behalf of the good brothers present and not present my name is Mildra I am your gaming monk stay 
fucking frosty, everybody.